so as the framers of the Constitution got together, you know, some of the things that they talked about leaving the Articles of Confederation behind, some of the things they had to consider were, okay, so how should the new government function under the Constitution? You know, who would have power? How would you share power between the federal government and the states? And how would you go about limiting powers uh, between the federal government and the states to make sure that one, that you had equity or equality between the states, whether they were big or small? So these things were issues that they had to contend with early on in the in the uh, development or consideration of a new constitution. Um, so when they had the Constitutional Convention in 1787, uh, you know they realized that the Articles of Confederation were basically too broken, and they really didn't. They really were too tightly clo too tightly connected to the old system, and so. Um, when they were, when they were moving forward with the idea of the of the new constitution, there were two camps that were divided by, into. One were the Federalists, those who supported the new constitution, the new federal constitution, and the Anti-Federalists, who were those who still wanted to hold on to the old Articles of Confederation. And uh, and it was really stratified around basically those the Anti-Federalists were those who still sort of had a love for the British Empire and. Even though they were now out, they were now on their own. They still wanted to hold on to those ideas versus the new system. Uh, so the so the Federalists, you know, what did they want? Of course, they wanted a stronger national government. They wanted these, these states, the states to be uh, large states to be more represented. Uh, they wanted to move away from to, to uh, from a confederal system to a federal system, and you'll see an example of that later on. And so there were two structures that we had in place at that time. One was called the Virginia Plan, which was a large state plan and called for a bicameral, meaning two houses in the legislature, which is what we have today, which we have a House of Representatives and a Senate that comprise our U.S. Congress, right? And so the large state plan was called the, was the Virginia Plan. And this is what the, the Federalists were primarily arguing for. The anti-federalists, you know, didn't want a strong national government. They wanted to keep a weaker central government and focus more on the state rights. Um, and they were they focused on what were called the smaller states. And like and they, this was called the, the New Jersey plan. And so you had these two competing forces that had to figure out how they were going to work together to either decide where they were going to what they were going to do. And so they came up with a combination. Um, so they took, so if you look at this chart, you'll see here, here are the Articles of Confederation from 1781, and you can see the structure of the country during this time. There was no executive branch, no judiciary, things like that. It was a unicameral legislature, meaning that there was only one house in Congress. Uh, there wasn't two houses as there are now. And then the, 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 the New Jersey plan, which was drafted in 1787, was called for a small state plan. Uh, they wanted the states to be supreme. They wanted a, a unicameral legislature like we had under the Articles of Confederation. They had they wanted to have multiple executives and no national judiciary. Then the large state plan, they called the Virginia plan, uh, the national law was the gun point to be supreme. They wanted a bicameral legislature and uh, they wanted to be able to have a majority to pass, to pass laws. They wanted to restrict um, the uh, executive to one individual and to have a strong executive and to also have a national uh, judiciary branch. Okay, sorry, I had to step away for one second. <laughs> so let me just come back real quickly and tell you that after going through the battles to looking at both plans, the Virginia and the New Jersey plan, they came up with the Constitution of 1789, which called for a popular sovereign, a, like a president, if you would, uh, the national law would be supreme, not state law, but national law would supersede state law. They would have two houses in their legislature, um, that they'd have a majority vote to pass laws. Uh, congressional power should right to tax and regulate commerce, meaning to control the money. They'd have a strong executive branch. They'd have a federal court system. And they had an amendment process in order to get laws passed or updated. So this was the compromise, and they called it the Great Compromise uh, that led to the Constitution of 1789. 
Now, I will tell you that it, you know, it didn't just happen overnight. They didn't just sign it one day and it was just done. It took about two, or eh, not quite two, about, about a year and a half for them from the beginning to end to, to, uh, to actually get the, uh, get the signatures rat to ratify the Constitution. So let's, uh, as you can see here, the rest of the bicameral legislature. And then again, the biggest separation came from the North and South. Of course, the South is where the slaves were populated, um, even though it was the North had them as well. But the South didn't want to give them up because they, had, they needed them for the crops and doing all the field work. Um, and but yet this North didn't want the slaves at all, included in the population at all in, it's in terms of counting them. Uh, the South had not wanted to include them because they would, that would give them more political power. Uh, so they came up with what was called the Three-Fifths Compromise. And the Three-Fifths Compromise was a compromise that basically said that, okay, we're going to count the slaves as three-fifths of a person. Each slave is three-fifths of a person for a series of taxation. So for every every three slaves would be counted as, as a, one person. It's a really bizarre situation, right? Uh, they needed nine of the 13 states needed to agree to draft the Constitution. And then, the, of course, the Federalists, you know, really dragged their feet. Um, or, excuse me, the Anti-Federals dragged their feet. The Federalists were really pushing hard. And so three individuals created, wrote a very famous book, which um, you will probably learn about as you go to university, but after community college, about the Federalist Papers, written by James Madison, uh, John Jay, and uh, Alexander Hamilton which basically gave the support for why we needed to have a new constitution. So what they went back and did was look at what, what the problems were with the Articles of Confederation and then took those problems that were listed and then said, this is why the justifications for creating a new constitution. And that's how we got to our new constitution that we live with today. Um, <clears throat> so again, the process for the compromise that had to be created, there were four of them, the Great Compromise, the Three-Fifths Compromise, the Bill of Rights, which were the first ten amendments to the Constitution that, that we live with today, they're called the Bill of Rights, which are our rights as citizens to protect us from the federal government. And then the concept of federalism, meaning we had to create a structural framework for the democratic system that we were creating. And again, the early founders were so concerned about, it, about the people overthrowing the system that they really tried to purposely make even the new system not quite as strong in the central government because they were afraid of being overthrown. So again, this was Madison's, uh, was really the founding father for the idea of separation of powers, the checks and balances, and our federal system. He was the one who really came up with this idea. And uh, his notion of human nature, which is derived from John Locke, uh, was really one of the founding principles of how we were to govern in our country. And of course, our three branches of government, the legislative branch, which is, of course, our Supreme Court, along with the federal court system. So we have a whole infrastructure for lawmaking in our government. Uh, the executive branch, which is the law enforcing branch, and then the judicial branch, which is the branch that, uh, that interprets uh, the laws. So each one was supposed to individually and separately have their own control. So you would not have one branch that would have more power than the other, that they would all share power, but that they would also have checks and balances to make sure that one could not usurp the other. Now, it doesn't mean that in the world we live in today that one branch doesn't, that this exists in a perfect world. So for example, there are times in our history where the legislative branch has been more, more powerful. There have been times when the executive has been more powerful like right now, as you've seen under Trump and what Trump's And then times when the, when the judicial branch has been more powerful. So there are certain times and period where you might see it shift a little bit, but never to a point where you have one branch that is completely overtaking the system. So when we talk about the process of how you go about bringing the Constitution up to date, so when things have to be dealt with, to, uh, when you know, the world is constantly changing, so you have to be able to enact or create new laws or even update laws 
to accommodate the change. So when you go back and look at the history of America, you know, when July 4th, you know, 1776, yeah, you know, we're, the war's over and we're now free, but everybody wasn't free. Certainly the slaves weren't free and women weren't free and most of the people in the United States weren't free, only mainly the wealthy white landowners were free. And so that allowed for a uh, system that uh, still repressed uh, a large segment of society, you know, up, you know, even up into the 20th century when women got the right to vote in 1920. Um, but they, they created a, an amendment process, and it took, uh, I call it the two-thirds, three-fourths plan. And basically, you had to have a two-thirds vote in both houses of Congress, and then you had to have three-fourths of the state legislatures, which we have 50 states, so three-fourths of that would be 38 states to approve or to amend the, constitution, the constitutional change. Uh, and that was the process by which to amend uh, the Constitution. So a two-thirds vote in both houses of Congress, and then if that happened, then it would go to the state legislatures for approval, and you needed 38 states of the 50, to know, which is three-fourths, in order to uh, pass or ratify or amend the Constitution. And this is the process. Um, and again, the checks and balances that they put in place, um, you can see here the detail of you know, how, the, how the judicial branch checks both the legislative and the executive branch, how the executive check checks the various branches. It's a pretty ingenious plan that they were able to, at this point in history, is you know 250 years ago or so, that they were able to visualize a, a construct, a plan that would allow for this type of system to exist. It's pretty impressive. Um, and times when it's worked better than other times. Uh, but it's still, you know, I would always tell people, and I would hope that you'll understand that, you know, we're never at a place where we're in a system of absolutes, that we should always be evolving and changing as time and societies change, that we have to be able to adapt and change with it. In fact, if we don't, we'll probably run into a lot of trouble. Of course, there are other types of systems that we'll be looking at further on that, just to assess, you know, when we talk about how to do a better job in our own system, we have to be able to look at other systems to ask that to ask ourselves, what can we do to make ours better? And so we, you know, we might look at the parliamentary system and the, of course president other presidential systems to continually assess with how well we do what we do in our own country and things we can possibly do to make them better. Now again, the, the various systems of government we have, like we you know when we talked about before under the Articles of Confederation, we were a confederation. And you can see here under the Articles of Confederation that um, the power flows one way from, it flows from the local governments to the national government, meaning that the states had more power than the central government. And then we adopted a federal system, which you can see the arrows go both ways, which means that the, state, the states themselves share power with the federal government. And again, we'll see more of how this all plays out as we go forward when we get to the, the further down in the class. But this allows for power sharing instead of the power being one way. And you can see in the unitary system, the power is dictated at the national government level and dictated to the local governments or state governments. So you can see these are the three basic systems. This is the one we started with. This is the one we ended with. Um, well, actually, I would say, let me digress from that. This is the unitary system, which is the British, the British system, right? The British government dictated power to the state, to their, to their governorates. This is the confederal system that we became after the Revolutionary War. And then this is the system that we adopted further as we, once we got our feet on, on the ground and started moving forward. And here's a good example of it as well, the, various, the, the three various systems. Okay, so when there's, when there's disputes between the states and the federal government, which happen frequently because, you know, the states want what they want, and sometimes the federal government doesn't always give each individual state what they want, uh, we have the Supreme Court gets to decide on disputes between the states uh, and the federal government as well as states between the states and other states as well. So they have the uh, final authority to, under Article 3, Section 2 of the Constitution. Now... Um, just make sure you understand the context of powers that are granted to each of these entities. Uh, when we talk about powers that are granted to the federal government, um, they're called enumerated powers. When we're talking about powers that are granted to the states, they're called reserved powers. 
and then the powers that are basically shared by the state and federal governments, and then they call those concurrent powers. So for example, under concurrent powers, both the state and the federal government can tax, right? Things like that. So that would be concurrent because they both have the ability to do the same job. Uh, and then you see below there the necessary and proper clause, to you know, which basically gives Congress the authority to make it, to make any law required to carry out its powers. Uh, and then the Tenth Amendment, which stipulated that, you know, that power is not explicitly given to the national government or reserved for the states. And the Supremacy Clause, which is the most important, that says that federal law um, basically is allowed to supersede or preempt any state law or state authority. So if a state tries to do something outside of the federal law, that the state, the federal government has a right to supersede their laws. Um, Ironically, as this rarely played out, we saw even during the days of slavery, after or at the, at the end of slavery, at the end of the Civil War, where federal law said that, hey, this is the, this is the new rule, no, no slavery, and yet the states were still enacting laws that were antithetical to the freedom of black Americans uh, post, post Civil War. So just because they put it on paper didn't mean that they were applying it equally to all people. Of course, uh, judicial review under the judicial system, the only Supreme Court has the right to determine if the laws coming out of Congress or state were actually constitutional. And so uh, under Marbury versus Madison in 1803, that really set up the, the power of the, of the judicial branch of government to interpret all laws and to, de to decide whether those laws were or not uh, constitutional or legal. Uh, so this is the, the structure of our system. Uh, a lot of times we talk about the funding, how the, how the government funds the, funds the states, and usually it's done through various types of grants, block grants, categorical book grants, or unfed, unfunded mandates are three of the mechanisms that they use to, to fund the states uh, from the national government. Uh, this is the amendment process, and I think I am done with Chapter 2. Okay. Thanks, guys.